Okay. Um, I guess to start off with is uh, to like an introduction to the, you know, to the listeners, your name um, and what you do. Um, and just a little bit about yourself, because I want, I like to personalize my, in my podcast, you know, I'm an ethical true crime podcaster. So I don't, I don't talk about the person who did someone wrong or did them um, to unalive, you know, the another person. I talk about the victims and the families in a very ethical way. Um, so yeah, no gory stuff about how they were done, what happened. Um, so I guess take it away. This is your platform as well. Um, so what is your name and uh, what do you do and a little bit about yourself? My name is Ruben. Uh, they call me Prophet P.I. Um, you know, I'm a pastor. Um, I got the Prophet P.I. from because I like to dig and stuff. I like to just, you know, dig deep. I used to be a skip tracer, uh, fugitive enforcement, but I also worked in loss prevention. I was a regional loss prevention manager. So you're dealing with the same type of training that law enforcement goes through. And, you know, just it's just you know, some skills that I have, plus being in the military also. But they call me Prophet P.I. I was, you're the second person I've met that was, uh, is military. I'm actually a military brat. My mother was Air Force. So, um, yeah. So this is awesome. What branch? I apologize. I must have missed that. Did you say what branch you were? I started out in the Navy and ended out, ended out in the uh, Marines. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Ruben, I appreciate that. Um, we can get started on any of the questions. If there's some questions in, that I provided to you, if they're like something that's kind of repetitive or you'll just go right into it and, and answer the questions, just, you know, it's all, uh, you know, your pace. Um, if you prefer not to answer some, just let me know. But um, right. I try to be ex existent extensive as possible because um, I want as much information out there for the public to know that this is not just like, you know, once in a life, once in a rare situation that, that occurs in our community, it's an ongoing situation and it needs to be addressed um, yeah. as many platforms as possible. And I took on the podcasting platform and you took on TikTok and I'm just scrolling in there like I'm just loving it. I'm love. I just listen to every story. It's unfortunate that uh, just recently um, that little boy was found um, deceased. Um, was it yesterday or today? Uh, I was I was rooting for him. I think his last name was Nichols. Um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. There's just so many. I can't even keep keep count on how many have we lost or has gone gone lost. So. Um, we can go on and get started. And I like to ramble on sometimes. I apologize. <laughs> uh, let's see. Can you tell us, um, the, the, our listeners, about your experience and background in, in advocating for missing individuals and seeking justice for the Black and Brown community? Are you there? Oh, there you are. Yeah, it was freezing. It was freezing up. Oh, did you? Okay, so it's the first. Ooh. I'm sorry. It's saying my internet is, my internet connection is unstable. I think it's on my side. That's okay. interesting. I apologize. I can ask yep. again. Okay. Um, can you tell us about your experience and background in advocating for missing individuals? and seeking justice for the black and brown community? Yeah, um, what started it was, I wrote a book, it's called Relentless Love Operation Rescue, um, and that's on Amazon. It's a story about my daughter who was kidnapped. She was she went missing. Uh, she went missing, um, she was missing about four years. I found her when she was seven. Um, tracked her across five different states. Her mother had joined a cult. And uh, with this cult, uh, I actually talked about a little bit it on TikTok and on social media um, with this cult, she, you know, was traveling around, they go off grid and everything. And I started using my skills to locate her and I found my daughter. And once I got her, um, 
other people started reaching out to me. They were like, hey, you know, you found your daughter. Can you help me? Started doing it, you know, it was just one of those where um, it, I guess it was just like a really deep passion you know, to try to help people find the lost. So that's what got me started in it. And as I as I got deeper and deeper into it, um, started getting results. Uh, we we had some uh, some young young people that went missing and law enforcement, you know, they reached out, they were putting out some stuff and uh, we helped find them. I had, you know, because most people don't call the police, but they will call somebody like myself, like you. And, you know, that way they're not getting involved with the police. And they called me, told me where this, these young people were. I called law enforcement, let them know they went and found them. They were safe. Uh, and it was a trafficking incident. And and then it just started going from there. Then I found a uh, a friend of mine. She was on social media. I think it was on on the book. And she had listed that her son was missing. Something was going on. And I've known her for. missing right now but you know just putting the information out there the news wasn't picking it up um law enforcement didn't put out any kind of alert and it was like unknown to everybody and um and and it broke my heart but it made me mad at the same time because i'm like why why are you not putting this out because if it was anybody else you're gonna put it out immediately so we started advocating started putting out the stories trying to we started digging Friends started uh, coming forward. Other people started coming forward. And that's when um, it just took off from there. It just really took off. And uh, we're still working that case. But we found out also working cases like that where Corey Daniel is missing. Then we found out that the same person who has ties to Corey Daniel has ties to another person who has been missing for over four or five years. Then we found out that this same person has ties to another person who disappeared in the same manner, um, but they found they found this person's um, deceased, but this person is tied to this other person. So it just went down a rabbit hole. And the more we dug, the more we kept digging. And the way I am, I'm going to keep digging until I get to the bottom. So I just kept digging and it started bringing out more stuff. That's when the news picked it up in California. Um, that's when uh, law enforcement actually stepped in. Then the federal authorities stepped in. And now it's 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 it's, all, it's a nationwide thing now, you know, to where they're like, OK, you know, they're putting pressure on us. Um, I've actually had law enforcement reach out to me and tell me, you know, hey, can you calm it down just a little bit because it's putting too much pressure on it? And I'm like, no, I'm going to keep putting pressure until you find them until you actually take us serious that, that's but that's just you know how I got started in all this wow that's a um I am so glad that your daughter was found um if I had uh if every person had a father like you that was just determined no matter what persistent no matter what and I know there's a lot of people out there who are doing that um and sadly they're not getting the same result or there is the outcome is different um, so I'm, I thank you for sharing that story. That's awesome. That is wonderful. Um, I think you probably pretty much answered like, <laughs> uh, answer two and three or a little bit of that. Um, in what ways have you utilized TikTok as a platform to raise awareness and share stories of the missing lost individuals? And can you provide some examples of successful campaigns? I think you pretty much talked about one story. Um, did this come initially from the TikTok or was it, do you have another story that you could also identify that was successful um, from a TikTok? Um, man, there's like, I think I have like over 7,000 videos. Um, there's like um, many where we, well, there was a young lady, I forgot her name, but there was a young lady that went missing. She's 13 years. She was 13 or 14 years old. She went missing. Um, and she had a child while she was in the foster care system. And she ended up uh, going missing, disappeared. Nobody could find her, law enforcement, nobody. And it was kept quiet. And the moment that um, um, somebody had reached out to the mother and told the mother to reach out to me. And when I reached out, uh, and put, put a video together for this young lady and her baby, uh, immediately 
And th this is the amazement of social media. The young lady immediately and her boyfriend reached out to me and they said, they said, sir, we are OK. I'm like, prove it. Video call me and prove it. You know, let me know that you're OK. I want to see that you're OK. I don't want to make sure that you're fine. She video called myself and uh, one of my other uh, uh, co-workers with BNN, uh, the Black News Network. Um, they reached out to us, did, did a video call, and she showed us that, you know, she was fine, you know. And then she told me a little story as far as why she had to leave. And, um, you know, the foster care system is kind of jacked up. But uh, that was a successful story. We had another one where um, uh, there, there was another child that went missing young man he went missing um and it it had to do with something about peer pressure and um joining gangs and everything and and he didn't want to join um the people thought that he his family had money you know and they called themselves trying to um uh basically kidnapping and um i, I told a young man because i I have a computer science degree, so, you know, I'm a techie. So I told him certain things to do on his phone so we could track him, you know, that way we could track him and then I'll hand the information over to law enforcement. And that's when, um, when he did that, they were able to find him, uh, you know, a success story. There was another, uh, two or three other young ladies that went missing and uh, it started getting kind of dim because they had been missing for several months. And the moment that uh, family members and their friends reached out to me, they said, hey, can you run this story? Because this is what you do. Run this story. The moment we ran the story, not even a couple of weeks later, they were found. So uh, one was found like almost 700 miles from home. There was another one that was found in the next state over. Uh, there was another one that was found um, um, with a friend. You know, so so those are success stories. Not all of them are success stories, uh, but we do end up finding uh, that person, whether they're um, alive or deceased. Wow. Wow. It's, it's a, like you said, it's amazing what uh, social media can do when it's in the right hands, like yourself yes. and like many other people who are trying to use it for the better, for the good. Um, instead of just like, oh, I, I try new dance trend, you know, that to me is just like, I get it. We all need like a little, you know, clean cleanse of the palate, but there, we need to get back to work and finding this myth the missing people. So that's awesome. I like to hear that. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Um, let me see here. I think, yes. And like, is, I think we've talked about it. It's all about communication. Communication plays a crucial role in advocacy work. And how do you ensure that the stories of the missing individuals, particularly those from the black and brown communities are effectively communicated through social media platforms, like example, TikTok and any other platforms that you're currently on? Um, have, you uh, have you faced any challenges in this aspect and how did you overcome them? Yeah, there was one big case because a lot of these cases, especially when it deals with children, uh, it takes an emotional toll on you. Um, there was one big case that I worked. Um, the mother actually reached out. And she, you know, she was making this big fuss. So I put the story out there and, you know, and it was like, you know, everybody was gung-ho going for the grandmother and uncle. You know, we need to get them arrested and all this stuff. And then when that story reached, uh, I think it reached almost like three or 400,000 views. And then all of a sudden, friends started reaching out. People that knew the young lady reached out to me. People that knew of the family reached out to me. And they started sending me screenshots of text messages. They started sending me videos and all this other stuff. And come to find out, the grandmother and the uncle had nothing to do with this. The mother dropped the baby off and the baby was already deceased. She came back in order to try to put it on them. And I started doing more digging and more digging and more digging to where I even started contacting the law enforcement. We were talking amongst each other. And that's when we found out, I even got the autopsy report back finally and found out that, you know, right now they can't charge anybody because this family's known for covering for each other. But we did find evidence that um, narcotics was used by the mother and her boyfriend, and the baby had got a hold of this because it was on her bottle. 
And I mean, it, it was really bad. I mean, the living conditions were bad. It was so bad to where some of the videos, I, I couldn't even stomach it. And I'm a Marine. Um, but a lot of my challenges are there are people out here that try to pull on the heartstrings of of the public to where they, they will immediately put up a GoFundMe. They will immediately start saying, I need some money. You know, we need to do this, need to do that. And, you know, and people will literally pour into you. And when I start getting cases like that, now I look at look at every case with a side eye. Um, I start dissecting the entire case. I want to make sure that you're not going to tell me uh, a story that's not real. Just like uh, the case with um, the young lady that that uh, uh, was it Carly Russell. We started when we first got that story immediately. And, you know, and I even got the recordings immediately. I said something ain't right about this and it's not true. And I had everybody and their mama coming after me. You know, you just just, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whatever. It's not true. Then when it came out that it was because I started dissecting and I, I I have access. You know, a lot of people can do it. But uh, being a contractor, I have access to a lot of the um, highway cameras. So I went back to that date. And I started looking and that's when I started pulling it, pulled it down. I enhanced it and everything. And I said, no, no none of that stuff happened. And then the police actually picked it up. They asked, could they have that video? Yeah, you can have it, you know, and news stations and all that and found out it wasn't true. So a lot of the challenges are, uh, one, <clears throat> people telling stories that are not true. And, you know, we run it in we could be doing more important things by finding those that are truly lost, finding those that have been trafficked, things like that. But you're taking up our time with these stories here. Another one of our challenges is we have some families that do reach out and ask for help. Can we help them finding their, you know, uh, their, their loved one? Or if we can uh, dig down to the truth of finding what happened to their to their family member, you know, that they know we're going to dig. But the big challenge of that is sometimes the family will cause a whole bunch of drama. It'll be like toxic. And I don't deal with that. You know, the moment. Well, one thing I want to say about us at BNN and myself, uh, Profit PI on TikTok. Uh, one thing about us, we don't do this to get monetized. We do this because it's a passion. You know, we don't get paid off of this stuff. You know, we, we get donations, things like that, but we don't get paid for this stuff. We, we doing it because it's a passion to us. And we get some people that come in there and say, Oh, you're just trying to get clout, you know, off my family or whatever. Immediately. I'm the type person where I will cut you off. I'm like, you know what, find somebody else to run this story. And then they'll find out nobody else wants to run that. They said, if profit PI is not running it, I'm not going to run it, you know, because they know something is wrong with it. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we have, you know, either people are lying and trying to get sympathy and trying to pull money, you know, from the public, or there's a lot of drama tied to the entire thing. Like there's a young lady that's missing right now and we got involved in it. And then when we started seeing all the drama with the mother, the sister and some of the family, and it was bickering back and forth. And um, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff. I left the case alone. That's why I've just been silent about it. People are asking me update, update, update. And I'm like, no, ain't no update, you know, but then there's some cases where, um, you know, we have to come forward with um, um, what we found. Like there's one case with the, the father and his young daughter that was found that was um, supposedly um, 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 passed away from hypothermia. But as we started doing digging, uh, his family has reached out. Uh, friends of his have reached out. Even one of the homeowners that live in that area reached out to me. And some of the stuff I haven't even released yet, but um, come to find out, you know, it, it's deeper than that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so deep to where, um, you know, uh, the wife is involved, you know, and there's a third party and it's, it's real deep, you know, and those are those cases like that, that they can get trying to you. Um, some of the other challenges are, um, you heard about the rank in Mississippi um, police officers that had to plead guilty for what they did to a young man, my, um, um, Michael Corey Jenkins. Yeah. Well, some of the people down there reached out to me and I ran that story the next day. 
when I found out about it, right after it happened, I ran the story. They couldn't get into the hospital. The police were blocking them and all this stuff, right? So when I ran the story, it started picking up. People were reaching out. And um, an, an attorney reached out to me along with a private investigator and then some a couple of other advocates. So we had advocates also that drove down to Mississippi and we got got the parents into the hospital. We we got we snuck pictures. There was a couple of employees that worked there that helped us get pictures and stuff uh, because the police were trying to hide it. And after we ran the story and it caught so much traction, one of the police officers who wasn't named, he wasn't named at all, but he was there because um, he took a plea deal. And, and that, that's something that the public doesn't know. But he took a plea deal, but he reached out and he sent us the body cam footage of what happened, even though they tried to say there was none. There was body cam footage. That's why it was so easy for them to go and because people are like, well, why did they plead if there's no evidence? You know, there was plenty of evidence. It was on tape. And we sent that to we sent that to the DOJ and the FBI. We didn't send it to the sheriff down because he probably would have destroyed it. Mm -hmm. But but we sent it to them. That's why they played out state and federal charges and stuff. So we were responsible for that. But on the downside of that is a lot of stories that we do. And if you've seen my TikTok, a lot of stories that we do that we dig so much in, we get threats. You know, we get people that try to shut us down. We get our pages reported a lot, you know, and there's many times we had to go in and and get them restored and all this stuff, you know, but those are the a lot of the challenges that we deal with. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you when you got people who are, who are trying to shut it down, that means you're getting you're you're getting out there. You're being heard. You're getting yes. the word out there. So that's I think that actually someone told me when I started podcasting, it's like if you get your first show, that means you're you're doing something. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Um, you guys, you are you are an amazing person. It's just awesome to to speak with you because you just have so much. I can see it. Like when you talk, it's about passion. It's about looking for that person. It's and I'm glad that you've also mentioned that it's not you. You don't find any way to to get monetized out of that. And that's that was one of the reasons why I started this podcast because, like I said, it's free ninety nine for me. I use my own personal money. I don't, and if I do any type of donation, it goes directly to a, another organization that helps, you know, what I'm pushing for, the cause of pushing for, like, um, you know, helping with domestic violence or human trafficking. Um, I don't see myself benefiting off of someone else's grief. That's how I right. see it. That's mm -hmm. why I consider myself a whole different type of podcast because not that many people have heard of ethical true crime right. um, and that's a whole different level of respect honor recognition awareness to the people I talk to the families I talk to organizations with the same objectives as I the narr the narratives are uh, aligned and parallel to what I'm trying to get out there so this is amazing thank you for that appreciate that um let me see I think I'm not sure if I have well, you know, I mean, there's a couple of things I can say, you know, that there's been many times when, you know, you know how they have these uh, rewards mm -hmm. for you know, helping them arrest people and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. We turn them down every time. We turn them down every time, whether it's I don't care if it's one dollar, you know, but there's been rewards up to 50,000 and we turn it down. We like we just want to get justice. And, they, you know, they'll, they'll say, wait a minute. You know, I've never really heard of this, you know, but thank you. Um, cause currently right now with the missing six out of Missouri, we're currently working with law enforcement and we're working with the FBI. Um, I don't like police. I'm just telling you that now, but the thing about it is working with them because they, they told me, look, we need your expertise because you hunted that you, you found these people. We want to know how you did it. We want to understand about this, this group, this cult. And they said, they've never really heard of this stuff before and once they started getting into it information that i've been sending them and then there's a couple other people sending them stuff regarding how these cults work and because these cults deal with trafficking so 85 percent of people missing they are a part of these cults and it goes all the way back to uh malachi z dwight york it goes all the way back to royal jenkins and um nature boy you know uh uh, Rashad Jamal, all them. It goes all the way back to, you know, a lot of them. And 
Um, the FBI have been, you know, talking to them and, and dealing with uh, the major over there, the, uh, a detective, and just schooling them on what these groups do, you know, and now what they're, they're, they're doing is, and uh, they, they're wanting to invite me. I'm like, I don't know, but they want to invite me because they're trying to get all law enforcement around the United States involved. They want to get them trained. They want to get them up to speed. They want them to be able to have a certain um, uh, unit to where they do nothing but study these cults and then they can solve a lot of these missing persons and trafficking. Um, Cause they, you know, they even asked me, you know, why are you so passionate about this? I said, well, first of all, if you look at the statistics in 2021, there was over 190,000 missing people, bl uh, black and brown people that are missing 190,000. And when you look at that, over half of them are children and women, and nobody's talking about it. Just like I just did a case uh, a couple of days ago of a young lady who's been missing since January the 9th, a 13-year-old. She's been missing since January the 9th, and we're just now hearing about it. And these parents, when I talk to them, they're saying, hey, we're, we're having to go down there. We're having to fuss at them. We're having to you know, call them every day in order to get my child on a Amber Alert. You know, and I'm like, it's not right because anybody else, they're going to put it out there the same day. You know, um, I don't know if you've seen my other cases where the three, the, the two women went to Jamaica. Then the other girl who, who lived in Texas and called herself said that she was uh, kidnapped by a Hispanic guy. And somebody sent me the case. They sent it to me. And I'm like, I'm not running that because she's lying. You know, and they were like, no, she's not. I'm like, yes, she is. She's lying. And lo and behold, you know, it's it's coming out more and more that she's lying. But then I look at us and I'm like, wait a minute. Why are you not taking our people serious? You know, if you look at the indigenous people on on their on their tribal land, there's a lot of them that are missing. There's a lot of trafficking going on. You look in our communities, inner city kids are missing every single day. North Carolina. Uh, I just looked it up within the past two weeks. There have been over 30 cases of missing teenagers, black and brown teenagers that are that are missing. And I'm like, why have we not heard about this on the news? So the blessing is with social media and um, podcasts like yours, you know, and, and many others. We can get the word out there. We can get it out there because we're going to force everybody to hear what we have to say. And that's what I like about social media. We're going to put it out there. Our voices are being heard. People are like, you know what? Your stuff comes down my timeline all the time, you know, and then that's what makes and the kids, the kids, the, some of the ones that are missing or have ran away, it comes right across their page. They're like, wait a minute, you know, hey, I need to reach out to this guy. You know, so that's why our voices are very important. We got to keep crying aloud. We got to keep uh, speaking out so we can find our, our people. You know, let them know that we're here. Exactly. Very true. Very true. Strong words. Absolutely. If you want to. Um, let's see. I think we left off. I was actually going to ask you about, because I know we were talking about um, some of the cases that are not bring the, bringing the, prop, the attention that, you know, sometimes some, sometimes not. Uh, and I just did like probably about two weeks ago or so, I actually did an episode specifically on the Ebony Alert that just yes. became effective on January 1st of this year. And I talked about some of the stories that were successful and some some that are still out there missing that ironically are one of the last, I think there was only from what I understand, at this point, there's been three Ebony Alerts. There might be more. Like you say, um, sometimes we don't get them across our page. Sometimes we do. Um, but yeah, there's one that did. The first one was originally, uh, they did find her. The other two are still missing. So, um, but yeah, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that's kind of like a, um, I mean, what are your thoughts? What are your ideas about that? Is that beneficial or do you think this is probably too much in regards to why they're pushing for the Ebony Alert? And I know on the episode, there's like four other states are trying to make this as an Ebony Alert for their states as well. Texas for being one of them. So, 
but that's surprising with Texas. Um, to me, it's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, even though, even though you know, it's you know, Ebony Alert is is is, is uh, focusing more towards you know the black and the brown people. Um, you're separating, you know, you, and, and it's almost like division. And when you do these Ebony Alerts instead of a standard, um, what do you call it, um, uh, Amber Alert, like they do for the children, uh, you're 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 differentiating them, you're separating them, you know, and most people are not going to pay attention to that. The same the, the same way that they're not paying attention now, you know what I'm saying? But um, you know, if an Amber Alert comes out and you're getting that out there, you know, and it's hitting the phones and 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 TV waves and all that stuff, uh, people are more apt to pay attention. Um, but but on the good sense of it, it's it's alerting uh, people to let them know, hey, you know, there's there's a you know little chocolate ch kid running around here that's that's lost. You know, we're looking for him, and that right there, you know, bring it it, it will bring attention to some. You know what I'm saying? But like I said, not all. Um, I'd love to get more into that. That way, that way, um, you know, when we put these call to actions out, you know, and with the Ebony alert, uh, it's 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 gonna, I guess, get more traction. That's what it needs, more traction. I'm I'm surprised that Texas is actually, you know, wanting to implement that. I'm really surprised. Yeah, it's um it was a shock to me when I was doing my research. It was like, wait, did I see this right? Cause I know for sure, Texas would be probably the, one of the last Southern states to even do that. But um, I'm glad they're actually acknowledging that that's one of the things that they're trying to put in the works. Don't know when it's going to happen. Hopefully it passes. Um, but I also like to play like devil's advocate because I think there was even one when I was doing the research in regards to Ebony Alert, there was a lot of things that kind of came out of it, like why ebony why the word ebony you know uh and like you said you know trying to separate us and trying to in a sense segregating it's almost like a segregating label but also as a devil advocate it's like we are trying to emphasize a disproportionate community to bring right. stronger awareness of the missing um children girls that don't fall under the particular policy and procedure of what an Amber Alert has to be approved on. Right. A lot of these kids are falling through the cracks as runaway. Right. Amber Alert is not used for runaways. Right. And like, for example, like the Feather Alert, I was just talking to um, Haley, who actually is one of my people that I, I interviewed today. She uh, established the first indigenous-based forensic lab called um, Okomi Forensics and um, located in Montana. And I said, you know, Feather Alert, I, that's the whole, this whole concept as well. Like, for example, like that, like why do you have to differentiate between people of color and, you know, the non-colored community? Because we have to, it's yeah. sad. We have to get to a point where we have to clarify, hey, these these children also are important to our society, our community, our, their families. They're not just like, oh, they're just a runaway or, oh, wait 72 hours, you know, oh, they'll come back or they're they're out partying, they'll, they'll come back on Monday after the weekend's over. No, you need to show the same importance as, blonde hair, blue eyed person goes missing right. or pretends that they went missing. And, you know, like the scenario that of, of the woman who was supposedly like kidnapped and so forth. And, and there it's, I feel very sorry and sad that people have to go lengths to look for attention and they looking right. for attention that takes attention off the people who really need that attention so right i just wanted to put my two cents in i just didn't know where you were at <laughs> but uh we could continue on with our questions i just i just thought that was like something we should bring up but uh let's see um let's see you 
kind of hit on, I think you kind of hit on number number six, which is like advocacy advocacy work often involves collaborating with various stakeholders such as law enforcement agencies, community organizations, et cetera. Um, number seven is um, dealing with missing person cases can be emotionally challenging. You know, you have a personal connection on the reason why you it's more passion involved searching and providing um, the TikTok videos and updates and so forth. How do you prioritize prioritize self-care and maintain resilience when faced with difficult circumstances or setbacks in your efforts? And can you give an example of a situation where self-care played a crucial role in your advocacy work? Yeah. Um, let me put it like this. Black and brown people have gone through the most traumatic stuff. And when people who are not like us go through it, they can go through the smallest thing. I had I had a guy one time said that uh, he had to check into a mental institution because his lights got cut off. And I'm looking at him like, wait a minute, I had to scratch my head. Did you say that? Did you, what, what? And I said, you know, that is nothing compared to what we have to deal with. You know, I, I got some friends that, you know, we, you know, we sit down and talk, you know, they're, they're, they're not black and, and they want to understand what we go through. You know, they want to understand uh, our community, you know, and we, we give them the real. And I let them know we from childhood, we, we deal with so much trauma. We deal with so much stuff, you know, where um, I would say 98 percent of black and brown people have, uh, you know, they have some type of PTSD because of what we deal with, you know, from home life, you know, to where the struggles come in, you know, um, um all the all the different things that we deal with on a daily basis, you know, even walking out out the door, um, you know, hopefully we make it to where we're going and then hopefully we make it back. You know, if it's not law enforcement, it's our own community, you know. So we've dealt with a lot of stuff, you know, coming up as children. And 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 it's sad we shouldn't have to, but that's what we go through, you know. So um dealing with a lot of the cases that I that, that I do. When it when it's adults, I can handle it a whole lot better, you know, because I'm approaching it with a tough love type attitude, that marine attitude. But when it's children, it really takes a toll on me, especially when I get deep into it, you know, because I feel like that child belongs to me, you know, and and it takes a big toll. And then there's times I have to at least take a couple of days to where I don't, you know, I'll probably scroll videos or whatever, but I take those times to myself. Um, in order to in order to keep my sanity, because um, it angers me. Uh, like one case I did, you know, a young father and his friend uh, unalived his his own baby girl, you know, because he was mad at the mother because she was dating somebody else because they broke up. So he took it to the extreme, you know, where uh, last year he he uh, stabbed her several times. And then and then this time, you know, he he unalived his baby and and it took a big toll. I'm just, I'm sitting I'm looking at this case and I'm talking to the family and then I'm I'm talking to the uh, the mother of the victim, you know, and I'm just hearing this pain. You know, sometimes I do interviews with them, you know, but I hear this pain in their voice, you know. Um, um, but when it deals when it deals with these young people, um, it breaks my heart because they shouldn't have to go through this. These young boys that are out here smelling themselves and they want to run in a gang and and they don't know what they're getting into. These young girls out here uh, being tricked by these dusty dudes that are sitting up here telling them all these lies in order to uh, get their pocketbook, you know? And and it's just, you know, it, 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 it racks my brain. But I literally take a couple of days to myself. That's why sometimes I take the weekend off because all during the week. Right now, currently sitting in my email, in my email inbox, um, so I got several of them. Um, I probably have no less than 800 stories of what's done happened to a kid, you know, if they're missing or if they they run away or they've been on alive or anything like that, you know, and I got all these stories and I, I'm trying to cycle them through because some of them I'll look at them and I won't do them because I know that it'll take a big toll on me, 
So I won't do it at all. And I'll pass it on to somebody else to do that. Like uh, a couple of young ladies on TikTok, Draco and and uh, Crimes Covered by Chris. I, I'll pass that. We share stuff a lot. So I'll share stuff with them. Or sometimes I share it with the BNN crew and tell them to run it. Sometimes they won't run it. They're like, no, nope, I can't do that, you know, because uh, I'm not that strong, you know, in order to be able to handle that mentally. But, yeah, I take I take a lot of time to myself, Um you know, maybe the weekend, sometimes during the week, I'll just take a couple of days off just to reflect. I'll go out there and play with the chickens or, you know, me and my little girl and my wife will we'll sit back and, you know, we'll probably find something to do, you know, in order to take my mind off of that. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're doing that because, you know, there's not that many men um, that I've spoken with. Um, I, I used to have a previous podcast that was dealing with um small businesses, entrepreneurs, musicians, and artists, I actually promoted them. Um, not And also that was a non-monetary thing. I just wanted to get people of color and their businesses out there. Um, and that was just kind of like business driven. But there was a gentleman on there that he, there's, he has a whole, whole group of gentlemen that, you know, they go they meet each other at their houses. They got to stay in communication with each other. They got to check on their friends because not that many men get the opportunity or, or, or think that they need that break, that self-care and they neglect themselves. You know, it's imperative that you do that. I'm glad that you are. Not that many men who will take the initiative to doing that because um, being a person of color, we have to deal with generational trauma. You know, that's in our DNA, like literally we've dealt with trauma from generations and centuries of, you know, being dismissed and being erased of our identity, you know, to being, you know, or watching our children being fed to, you know, crocodiles and alligators, you know, we had to go, our ancestors had to go through that, being lynched, being burned alive, you know being raped by multiple people, um, you know, being forced into slavery on many levels. And that's still, that's another label for human trafficking. That's just another label for slavery, um, being right. coerced into doing something for someone, being groomed by someone, using your body for someone. Um, it's just another, it's another thing that we have to struggle with. And uh, it's, and I'm glad that you take that moment for doing that. You know, self-care is a must. We got to push for that, especially. So um, thank you for sharing that. I think I'm going to probably jump to like number 10. And because I wanted to, because you were talking about some of the stories, you know, um, that you like to collaborate with or pass along to other persons who are TikTok or TikTokers who are just volunteering to assist you. But can you tell me if there's any stories that you would like to share that just isn't getting the kind of recognition um, that they that it deserves? Or um, um, I think that's pretty much it. Like, do you have yeah. anything like that? Uh, yeah. Um, the one. Uh, well, is that it's actually two cases. Um, one is the Corey Danieli case. And, you know, if anybody goes to my TikTok, they'll see a folder up there that says Corey Danieli. Um, We're still looking for him. Uh, we're trying to get the police more involved. Uh, we did find out that one of the people that's involved in this whole thing, um, he, he has a family of police officers and they're known for covering stuff up. Um, so the Corey Danieli case uh, that one right there, you know, he he, he disappeared under mysterious circumstances with this uh, friend, so-called friend. Uh, the friend, uh, nobody knew anything about it until the friend was actually posting on Corey Danley's page. He had Corey's phone. Uh, he had his clothes, his backpack. Um, he 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 asked his mother to wash Corey's clothes. Um, you know, and this is after the fact, after him missing and everything, and. And um, nobody can find him. Nobody can locate him, you know, and it's just too many stories. The guy has actually his name is uh, Zach. He he ended up running to Hawaii. Um, he's been questioned, but the police, um, they're dragging their feet. This guy has actually gone to Hawaii. Uh, he's over there now. 
But now the people over there, because I have family over there. We have Polynesian in our family. And I've reached out to them. They they watch my stories. And I told them, you need to watch out for this guy, you know, and, and um, you know, but the Corey Daniely case, because like I said, it led to uh, revealing uh, three other people that have been, that are missing the same way. Uh, Michael Bryson, he's been missing for over four or five years now, but Corey Daniely was in that circle. Um, another guy, his name is, uh, I forgot his name, but there's a couple other people. And um, so we're, we're trying to push that story, get more recognition on it. Another one is um, his name, his name is Cordell. Uh, I forgot his last name, but Cordell in Florida, he was found uh, strung up by his neck and they tried, they meet, well, actually there's like 10 of them, but I'm not going to go into all of those, but uh, Cordell uh, was strung up by his neck. They um, ruled, they immediately, the detective immediately, as soon as he walked in, the detective, uh, he didn't investigate the case. He just walked in and said, uh, this is self-inflicted. I mean, immediately, just like they did Nona, Nona uh, Lubrin down in Florida, just like they did uh, another young man. Uh, I forgot his name, but I did his story. Um, he was found. Um, I th we actually think his girlfriend and, and uh, some other people were involved in that. But he was found uh, in a parking lot or well, near a parking lot in a tree. And his his hands were zip tied together. But the but the detective did the same thing. This, another detective did the same thing. He said that um, that that he did this on his own. And we're like, no way. So now we're putting pressure on him. And it just it just needs to get out there to where uh, cause we got so many details of the story. We got we got suspects, all kinds of uh, we got a timeline of events and it's too much evidence for them to try to rule this um, uh, self-inflicted. You know, it's, it's just too much. So so we're trying to get more uh, national attention. You know, I mean, it's already across seas. I'm like, if they're talking about this across seas, why are we not talking about it over here? Because we don't string ourselves up like that. We don't do that. You know, we, we're going to take any other kind of way out, but we're not going to do that. And, you know, especially looking at the circumstances and stuff, you know, um, something is not something is not right. But we have found that a lot of people that are tied to the case have family in law enforcement. And I said, ah. So we need to expose that. And, I, and I'm the type where I'm going to call it out. You know, I don't care who you are. I'm going to call it out. Police chief, mayor, whoever, you know. And then when you start putting pressure on them like that, then they have no choice but to uh, properly investigate it. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, those are the cases right there. And I'd be glad to send, send you to you because, you know, they need to get out there. They really do. Absolutely. Yeah. Please send them my way. You got my email, my contact information. So speaking of contact information, how are people able to follow you on what uh, platforms that I could probably give to the listeners in the show notes? Well, um, uh, on TikTok, it's Profit P.I. Um, yeah, or Profit Ruben M, R-E-U-B-E-N, and then the letter M. Um, on Facebook, it's uh, Prophet Ruben Mitchell. Um, you, you'll see that on there. And then I have Instagram and it's under Prophet Ruben um, on Instagram. But also um, on our YouTube, we have uh, it's called BNN underscore uncut. Um, it's the black. It's actually BB, BBNN. It's black and brown news network because um, we we cover those those type of stories. People get mad at me sometimes. They're like. You know, well, the other people, they get mad at us because they're like, why don't you uncover this right here? Because I don't want to, you know, because we need recognition. We need to get stuff out there about our people, you know. Um, so but, yeah, we have BNN uh, underscore uncut on YouTube. And, um, you know, we we get ready to uh, work on we're working on right now, currently uh, coming up with our own platform similar to TikTok but it's going to be our own platform to where we're not censored because uh, right now we're censored on there. You notice, you know, we, we got to say unalive. If it's us, we got to say unalive. We got to make up these different words and stuff. Right. But other people get to say the actual words, you know what I'm saying? They get to do their thing. So I want to make a safe place for 
um, all all people to where, you know, you can uh, speak that truth, you know, and get it out there and stuff. But it, but it's going to be a safe place to where we don't have to worry about, um, you know, any type, any, any type of racism, anything like that. You know what I'm saying? But we we really need it. I remember when um, what was it? Uh, um, it was a uh, black. I think it was called. Uh, I think I know what you remember. Black Planet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was about to say, just like the Black Planet back in the day. Yeah, I'm I am I'm up there. So I I remember <laughs> I remember. Uh, you know, Black, Black Planet was was I was hoping that it just reached this its potential and its peak and everything, but they gave up too fast. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, you know what? I want to tap into that you know, and then put a team together and we go in there, we can actually do our own to where we're able to get stories like this out. You know, the podcasts are, you know, streaming and and people are actually able to uh, voice uh, their talents. You know what I'm saying? Right. Voice their talents, you know, to do what they need to do, you know? Exactly. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep me in the loop on that one because that would be awesome. That would be so awesome. To, I will be sharing the crap out of that. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, thank you so much. I don't know if you have any questions for me, but I can probably just kind of give you an outro on what I will do afterwards. But um, did you have anything that you'd like to ask of me before we close on? No, actually, uh, you know, I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Uh, your voice is bigger than you think. All right. Um okay. Uh, I'm going to send you an email uh, with some different platform uh, to, that you can use where you don't have to you don't have to worry about using uh, uh, stuff like Zoom and everything that you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get the same reach plus more with these other platforms and stuff, you know, that you just download and, and put your, your uh, stream keys in it and you can be all across all platforms and it's free. OK, I probably know a couple of them, but I'm like. Time to get that all set up, you know, get all the codes set up. You know, I, I think there was one that was actually referred to me and I was like, okay, I will literally have to have a, a stay at home job to take time to actually put in the right codes, get the, you know, get all the stuff set up. I'm just like, I wanna, I wanna push, but I love technology, believe me, I love technology. But uh, there's some that are like, um, I don't have the time for that. <laughs> These are easy. You know, the, the one that I use is very easy. I mean, it's real simple, you know, and, uh, you know, playing with it, getting your own backgrounds or whatever you want to do. But it's real simple and easy. It's just a few clicks and everything. And you're you're up and running. OK, send it's it running. over. Yes. <laughs> send it over. All right. Well, um, 